We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There's an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. I don't think we're too late yet, but we better stop acting like we have all the time in the world. When our children and our children's children look back at our generation, will they say, that was a generation of cowards that let the world fall apart? Or will they say, that was the generation that turned it around? That's why we're here today. That's why we're doing okay. And it's really up to us. I wanted to thank Jesse and the Governor's Conference for, for bringing me out here. I, I really do love the state and I love uh, talking to young people and working with young people. It's what I've given my life to um, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Before I start, uh, I wanted to see if there were uh, four people in the audience. Joseph McNeil, Franklin McCain, David Richmond, or Ezel Blair Jr. Are they out there? Okay, well, I'll come back to that. Um, I wanted to begin by uh, sort of grounding this talk in this conference in my experience being a, a young person thinking about global warming and how it's begun to affect me. Um, the sort of aha moment for me on global warming was uh, the summer of 2002, uh, I spent four months in India and I was doing a bunch of work there and I, I was able to visit uh, the source of the Ganges, uh, the holiest river in India, which is a glacier in the Himalayas or set of glaciers. And I went up there and there were scientists studying the glaciers and they were, they sort of showed me, they were like, you could see where the glacier was and they were like, it was there last year, it was there the year before, there the year before that. And they began to tell me, you know, that 40% of the world gets their water from glacial melt from these mountains up in the Himalayas. They create the, the major rivers of uh, China and India and that whole area of the world. There was also a summer of major drought and floods in India that were causing all sorts of problems for the food supply and water supply for people there. And I began to understand my responsibility as an American for the problems that they were seeing there. Began to understand that as an American, we contribute 25% of the global warming emissions in the world with only 4% of the population. So I ended up going back to Yale um, and dropping out and uh, began organizing uh, with other young people. We are, are part of a generation, the, us, the younger folks in this room, are part of a generation that has come to age uh, in a time of unparalleled luxury on the one hand and at a time when our world and our future and our children's future is literally melting away. And we see it and feel it in very different ways. There are young people in the Arctic who's, you know, it is actually melting away. The permafrost is melting, the ice caps are melting. Young people on the Gulf Coast who were hit by Hurricane Katrina, and they know what, um, they, they felt it hard there. Young people who grew up in the shadows of the fossil fuel economy grew up near coal plants and coal power plants. Um, and as a young person, I know that, you know, seeing all of these things and being bombarded by all of this, it's, you know, can be confusing, uh, overwhelming, can make us angry, and see some of the opportunities in there as well. Um, 
But all of my experience working with young people, I've found that when engaged, when asked to be involved, they want to get involved and they want to fix it. I think our generation is beginning to find its voice on this issue and the world has never needed us more. When I began this talk, I asked if Joseph McNeil, Franklin McCain, David Richmond, and Ezel Blair Jr. were in the room. They were four African American students from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College who on February 1st, 1960, sat down at a segregated lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. They were refused service and beaten and began the sit-in movement that spread all across the country and was a major catalyst in the civil rights movement and transformed this country. They're only a few years older than all of you. I want to ask again, is Joseph McNeil Franklin McCain, David Richmond, or Ezel Blair Jr. out there in the audience? Stand up. Stand up if you're ready to fight for your future. So I have, I have three requests for you all. Help us make the Campus Climate Challenge in Wisconsin huge. Every high school in this state should be running the Campus Climate Challenge and should be getting their schools to become climate positive. Raise your hands if you can help get your school registered with the challenge. Raise them high. Second. Be bold. Come from a place of where we need to go, not what's politically realistic or politically possible, but from where we need to go and bring moral clarity and urgency to your work. Think of Martin Luther King. Think of Ezel Blair Jr. Think of them. And know that this is the cause of our generation and that it's up to us to take it on. And finally, Find your own unique contribution and run with it. This is not only a movement that takes all kinds, it is a movement that needs all kinds. It's a movement that needs engineers and musicians and poets and writers and farmers. So take your own passion and your own interest and your own strengths and bring that to bear to help build this movement. 